We all heard all this stuff about Russian disinformation and Russian interference in our elections. China has an entire military department dedicated to this. I think this virus, as terrible as it is, has been a wake-up call. How can any country that's doing business with China fully trust them? They can't. Plain and simple. There's so many different things to investigate. Why China? Well, right now there's a big propaganda battle. China's, of course, gained significant control over Hollywood. They can then control what is shown in our movies. It is changing the way you perceive something. At what point did you say, I'm going to go much deeper than I am right now? It is a totalitarian regime that has no problem throwing Muslim Uyghurs in slave camps, tearing down churches of house Christians that will use Falun Gong practitioners as living sources for organ transplants. How is U.S. being bullied by China right now? The Chinese regime regards the United States as its number one enemy. For things like methamphetamine and other drugs, we're coming from Wuhan. Say this is over with, post-coronavirus and COVID-19, what's going to change with our relationship with China? The Chinese people will riot. They will overturn police cars. They will curse the Communist Party. They will stand up against it. I don't think the Communist Party itself is going to survive this. 30 seconds. Did you ever think you would make it? I feel I'm so close, I could take sweet victory. I know this life meant for me. Yeah, yeah. yeah, why would you bet on Goliath when we got bet David? Yeah. Value came in, giving values contagious. This world of entrepreneurs, we get no value to haters. How they run, homie, look what I become. I'm the, I'm the one. My guest today is Joshua Phillip, who is a senior investigative reporter at the Epoch Times. He did a documentary that I watched, which at this point on all the platforms combined, whether it's Facebook, YouTube, and their websites, got over 100 million uh, views. And what he studies and he researches and investigates is on politics, cybersecurity, and defense tied to China. So with that being said, Joshua, thanks for being a guest on Valuetainment. It's a real pleasure. Some great stuff to talk about. I'm looking forward to it. So let me ask you, what caused you to want to, there's so many different things to investigate. Why China? Well, so my, my investigations on China started way back in 20, or sorry, 2008. And it was actually unintentional, to be honest. Um, I had stumbled acro across some pretty strange occurrences. There were acts of, you know, physical attacks taking place in one of the big Chinese communities. And over the course of a few years, I uncovered what was what, what's now called and very well known as the United Front Work Department, basically how the Chinese regime extends its suppression and arms into foreign communities, working with things like uh, Tongs, these fraternal organizations that basically run Chinatown, uh, you know, organized crime, you name it. Got it. So that, that's, kind of, that's kind of what prompted you. So as you got in, at what point did you say, I'm going to go much deeper than I am right now? Well, it was a step-by-step -step thing. So when, when I first got into this beat, I mean, it was stuff I'd never heard of. You know, people were telling me, oh, you know, th that guy's a spy. This guy's a spy. You know, and I'm in, I'm in Chinatown. I'm seeing people physically attacking people. I'm seeing these large groups come out with signs and people are getting death threats. People are coming up to me and they're telling, you know, Chinese people, they're telling me, oh, they told me they can, you know, threaten my family. They told me they can make me disappear. And... You know, I mean, it, it's bizarre. I, I, I had never encountered anything like this. I had no idea how to understand it. And so for me, the investigation was more, I had a lot of questions and I wanted to figure out what was going on and try to get to the bottom of it. Um, over the course of time, of course, after I uncovered the initial pieces of it, yes, that these individuals were, of course, being rallied up by the Chinese consulate, uh, the Chinese consulate general at the time, Peng Ka Yu, uh, we actually had some stories showing that he was meeting with the individuals, uh, encouraging them and so on. Found out over time that, you know, this is a bigger picture than what I thought initially. And over time, I uncovered what's now pretty well known, which is the Chinese regime's whole system of unconventional warfare, uh, culture warfare, business warfare, cyber warfare, you name it. That's been their main. So that's what you've come to a conclusion with. Now, how often have you been to China yourself? Uh, never. I am I am proudly blacklisted, as is Epoch Times overall. But we, we do have offices in Hong Kong and Taiwan, though, but mainland China, we've been blacklisted almost from the get-go. When you say blacklisted, what, is, what does blacklisted mean? Because people have told me, hey, some of the stuff you talk about could potentially get you blacklisted. What is, what is blacklisted? 
Well, blacklisted for some media means, of course, you have no visa. They don't tell you why you can't go there. You're never allowed to go, you know, do research there or reporting there. For us, blacklisted started, I think, in 2000, or soon after we launched Epoch Times. Uh, Chinese officials or Chinese police knocked on the door of, you know, some of our Chinese staff who were in China, arrested the entire office. Our editor spent 10 years in prison and they tortured him. One of your editors from Epoch Times spent 10 years in prison and tortured him. Yep. And was he freed? Uh, he was uh, several years ago. He was freed, yes. And what stories did he share with you that when he was there for 10 years, what did they do to him? So when he first got out, uh, he did talk with me. I don't know the details about the torture. It's, geez, this was probably good five years ago now I interviewed him. I can't remember. There, there were some public reports about his case. Of course, some of these... Uh, you know, journalist, uh, journalist rights organizations did have some things on him. Um, but, you know, he, his spirit wasn't crushed. He, uh, he's still very much about getting the truth out in China. Somehow he hasn't been arrested again. So that's good to, good to know. <laughs> Where is he at now? Is he in the States or is he, he in Hong Kong or Taiwan? Last I've heard, he's still in the mainland. He's still in the mainland. But, but he's, he's not involved with Epoch Times anymore after he, after he got out, of course, because, you know, they have him under surveillance. Oh, got it. So he cannot be doing what he's doing with you guys because he's under surveillance. So it wouldn't so, last very long. Yeah, if he did. So, so from the moment you did the documentary, which uh, went viral and it was shared by everybody around the world, I'm sure a lot of people contacted you. A lot of different people telling, sending their own stories. Here's what I know. Here's what I know. Uh, what's changed from the stories in the documentary? Which, by the way, you had General Spaulding there. You had Gordon Chang there. You had Duke, Dr. Judy. Mikevitz there, which is how I saw and found out about Dr. Judy was through your document. I believe you were one of the first ones in the last, you know, during this era of uh, uh, the China and coronavirus that we heard about Dr. Judy, where other people have been now interviewing her. What's changed from seeing the documentary from China to today? Well, since the documentary re was released, there have actually been a lot of reports corroborating what we said. Um, you know, there are, of course, now investigations going into it, specifically on individuals that we directly point to, such as this Dr. Xi Zheng Li, this bat woman of China, as being one of the possible central figures in this entire thing. Uh, the U.S. is launching multiple investigations. I just reported, for example, uh, they, cut, they cut funding to an NIH program that was going to China. Uh, Dr. G, uh, sorry, this Dr. Xi Zheng Li is actually named in, in some of the reports on that. There was a Pentagon program that was uh, also, you know, it's being investigated right now, sending money to China. Other ones, many of them are mentioning Dr. Xi Jiang Li. There's investigations into some of the U.S. universities, such as in Texas, and also, again, naming directly Dr. Xi Jiang Li and this Wuhan Institute of Virology. And so it does appear that we, at the very least, contributed some evidence that may be helping some of these investigations. We'll have to see. And of course, a lot of media came out after we published the video uh, doing interviews such as, for example, Washington Post had, a, had an article noting that in 2018, there were State Department cables warning of security problems at that laboratory. More articles like that have come out. There have been some other ones, exclusives and other media, really just corroborating what we said as well. So what is your biggest concern? What's your biggest concern with China today? You're, My big you're so deep into it. What's your biggest concern? So when, when it comes to the way I view the Chinese regime, it's maybe a bit different from a lot of how a lot of people view it. The Chinese regime regards the United States as its number one enemy. The very existence of a country that you know, is based on the ideas of, say, individual rights, uh, de does defend internationally to some extent human rights, uh, does believe in this idea that if given basic freedoms, people can create a prosperous society. These things are antithetical to the narratives and the practices of the Chinese Communist Party. It tells people that they are not capable of creating a harmonious and functioning society if people are given freedom like we have here. And so challenging that, attacking the United States, undermining this perception is a huge part of what the Chinese regime is doing. And when it comes to their systems of warfare, of course, when we think war normally, we think tanks, guns, soldiers, you know, jets, missiles, these kinds of things. When you're dealing with the Chinese Communist Party, they're talking about culture, they're talking about drugs, they're talking about business warfare, cyber, they're talking about the basic perceptions, things like they have the three warfares doctrine, psychological warfare, media warfare, and legal warfare. How do you, how do you alter international perceptions of issues? How do you manipulate 
the, say, basic perceptions of a country in order to support or oppose what they want you to support or oppose. Well, so you said psychological warfare, media warfare. What was the third one? Legal warfare. So, yeah, the three warfare's doctrine. That, that would be part of three war, warfare's doctrine. The other ones I mentioned. One Go through each one of them on how yeah, they do sure. So I'll use the South China Sea as an example, because this is a very clear example of that playing out. The three warfare's doctrine is actually adopted into the Chinese military's strategy. It is an officially adopted military strategy. And it's based on three points. It's, ba it's based essentially around manipulating the psychological and legal standpoints in order to obtain objectives. I mean, this sounds complicated, but let me explain it. Now, on the surface, psychological warfare is not necessarily propaganda. It's not necessarily misleading you. Psychological warfare is altering the conclusions you come to when observing information. It is changing the way you perceive something. Media warfare is a manipulation and control of, say, news outlets, social media, any outlet of information. Legal warfare is the manipulation of legal systems. They call it lawfare sometimes. But let's look at this in practice, okay? So when we look at the South China Sea, the Chinese regime used this to the T as a military strategy. What did they do? They start going into the South China Sea, building military bases, building artificial islands, putting up missile defense systems, you name it. Very hostile actions, even challenging other nations, putting up a, you know, an air defense zone, saying other countries can't enter their airspace without checking with them first. This is, you know, it's conquering, it's traditional conquering. That's what they were doing. Just taking territory, saying it's ours, saying nobody can come in unless they tell us first and we give them permission. But how did they take it? That is where the three warfares comes in. On the psychological warfare part, they created a narrative. And what was the narrative? The narrative was one of historical ownership of the region, one that painted China as a victim and gave them, of course, the perceived rights and even, say, justified actions of going in and taking this territory. They said they had historical ownership of this region. It was taken from them, from them unjustly by Japan, by these different deals after World War II. That was the narrative they used. Um, then they, what did they do after that? They go into the media warfare element. It's very easy to manipulate the media, extremely easy. If you're a country like China, all you need to do is, well, two things. One is you have your former officials or current officials go to any big news outlet and tell them, I got an exclusive story for you. I'll tell you the real story of what's happening in China. And they're going to publish everything that person says. The other one is if a media writes a critical story of China, if they're, if they're talking about it, they can easily just have, you know, an academic or say a top level Chinese official go to them and say, your article was racist. Your article was offensive. Uh, you know, you don't understand China. Have you ever been to China? How dare you write about my country? And that journalist is going to get on his knees and say everything that person tells him. He's going to be eating out of their hands. And you see it all the time. And so that's media warfare. And then when you get into uh, legal warfare, that's the maintaining the battle within the legal realm so it does not enter the diplomatic or political or sorry the diplomatic or the hot war realm and so again south china sea you have the chinese regime taking military action building military bases being you know taking very hostile action against other ships sink you know sometimes even ramming and there were cases of uh, you know for example other ships from other countries being sunk uh, mainly fishing 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 vessels and things like that very hostile actions regardless though but they kept it from entering the military realm by maintaining it as a legal battle. And so they locked it in the international courts. Eventually, of course, the courts you know, ruled against China, said it does not have historical ownership of this territory. But by that time, they'd already mostly won the international uh, battle of perception. And in addition to that, they said, well, in Chinese law, by our laws, we still have rights to do this. And you know, if you want to challenge us, come to China's courts, come to our courts and challenge us. And of course, they were, you know, they control the court system down to the most minute levels. There's no way you're going to win a battle in China uh, like that. How is U.S. being bullied by China right now? Uh, on many fronts. So if you want to get into the broad picture of it, the, say, the type of real bullying, if you were to ask me, that's when you get into things like economic theft, you get into things like culture, you get into things like drugs. Um, you know, again, what they call unrestricted warfare. And it's based on, you know, this is actually the name of a book. It's a lot of China experts talk about it as being kind of the, uh, 
the basic framework through which China has waged an unconventional war on the United States. So 1999, two Chinese colonels wrote a book called Unrestricted Warfare, where they proposed a new system of war without morals. And it's based on a very simple way of thinking. Now, if you want to get into the, the you know, nitty gritty, the gist of it, we could go on forever talking about all the different forms of unconventional war they run. You know, names all across the board, everything you could think of being targeted. But it comes down to this. It's a perception of saying, what would you want to achieve through warfare? And how can you achieve those exact same goals without engaging in open combat? And so, for example, culture warfare, uh, you know, China's, of course, gained significant control over Hollywood, not just through, say, manipulation, say, forcing them to abide by Chinese laws when it comes to censorship and propaganda, if they want to get their films into China, which is a huge market for Hollywood, especially right now when, you know, films aren't doing as hot, uh, to, you know, for example, buying up, in, buying up parts of ownership in, say, production houses, talent houses, buying AMC theaters, for example, these types of things, you know, they can then control what is shown in our movies. I, for example, they can't, if they want to get into China, they can't show China in a negative light. Mm. They can't show the U.S. military in a positive light if they want to get into China. They need to maintain, say, you know, at least one scene in China. They have to have at least one Chinese actor or actress and so on. Certain requirements for that. And of course, the Chinese regime, Xi Jinping, actually back when they launched a lot of these operations, came out and said the United States is launching a culture war on China and said that they needed to retaliate. They, they talk about this stuff openly. Uh, when it comes to drug warfare, for example, how do you destroy the, the moral fabric of a society? We talk about things like these uh, synthetic drugs, fentanyl, that comes from China. But what's actually not really as well known is that most of our drugs come from China. The drug cartels in Latin America, they get their precursor chemicals from China. In fact, there have been some reports saying that they're having trouble manufacturing because a lot of their labs they were getting their precursor chemicals from for things like methamphetamine and other drugs were coming from Wuhan, the epicenter of this virus. And so, you know, you, you name it across the board. This is how this is the real way they're bullying America. Ecstasy is coming from China. I haven't heard ecstasy, but uh, a lot of these synthetic ones would. Yes. So. Um, I in order for things to, for me to say where the world is a little bit more comfortable with China, it would mean their foundation would need to change, right? Meaning because their foundation of communism, control, controlling media, controlling everything that the people do, not allowing free press, free speech. You don't have a Facebook, a YouTube, a Twitter, any social media platforms that are open in China for the public to use. You know, and, and if that doesn't happen, how can any country that's doing business with China fully trust them? They can, plain and simple. And of course, it's, it's interesting now to see that a lot of countries are starting to finally realize this. I think this virus, as terrible as it is, has been a wake up call to a lot of countries seeing that, you know, there, for example, in the UK and Australia, where they're calling for investigations into the Chinese regime and the Chinese regime is coming out and threatening them openly. This is, for example, a big, a big story in Australia right now, where they're, you know, they're calling for investigations into the origin of this virus, looking in, again into this Wuhan laboratory as a possible origin. The Chinese regime is threatening them with punishment, saying we're not going to send Chinese students to Australia anymore. We're going to hit you economically if you keep calling for this. Um, in the UK and Australia, say, they're saying the mask that the Chinese regime once wore, this friendly mask, has fallen off, and they're finally seeing it for what it is. It is a country dedicated to the defense of its narratives. It is a totalitarian regime that has no problem, for example, throwing Muslim Uyghurs in slave camps, that you know, doesn't mind tearing down churches of house Christians, that will use uh, Falun Gong practitioners, people trying to be good people, as living sources for organ transplants, that can lock down Tibet and still, amidst all of this, be portrayed somewhat positively by the media, saying China is changing when they have not changed one drop. How much do you think things are going to change moving forward post-coronavirus and COVID-19 with foreign relations? And what I mean by this is, say this is over with. Let's just say this is over with. What's going to change with our relationship with China? A lot's going to change. A whole lot's going to change. Now, let's, let's look at the overall situation. This virus, personally, to start, I do not think the Chinese regime is going to survive this. I don't think they're going to make it through this. And they're facing pressure from multiple angles. And when, when I say this, 
Now, if you were to ask me a couple of years ago, I, I would I would not have said this, but I'm, now this is where it's heading. And here's here's a situation. This virus came at the worst possible time for the Chinese regime strategically. It happened right at the height of the Hong Kong protests when the when the authoritarian nature of the Chinese regime was being called out by the Chinese people themselves. When the people were waking up, when they showed, you know, people in Hong Kong knowing about the Tiananmen Square massacre decided that they are willing to stand up to that regime, risking an action like that from the regime, seeing signs of, you know, that they can make you disappear. Uh, for example, two million people out of a, out of a you know, city of uh, about seven million. And so, a lot, you know, six or seven million, depending on how you weigh it. And so a lot, you know, a huge portion of the population, the Chinese regime is terrified these protests are going to spread into the mainland. Then you have in Taiwan a landslide election against the party that is opposed, or against the party that was supportive of the Chinese regime. And so the anti-CCP party, anti-Chinese Communist Party party in, in Taiwan won the election. And then in mainland China, you had, business, you had businesses shutting down. You had people, of course, you know, losing their jobs because of this whole China, U.S.-China trade war. The situation for them was, was the worst possible time. Then you have a virus come out that completely shuts down the Chinese economy, causes a lot of social instability. And when you're a totalitarian regime that has maintained essentially social control through two things, one is fear and uh, the other one is through finance, and both of these things are suddenly destabilized where people become willing to stand up to you because they're more afraid of your totalitarian systems that, you know, they, they believe that standing up against you will bring them better outcomes than living under your heel. You know, that's where China is right now. People are no longer afraid to protest against it. They're no longer afraid to call it out. We had reports of people in Wuhan, the epicenter of this virus, going out on their balconies and shouting curses into the night sky at the Chinese regime because it was, it was the only outlet they had in terms of calling it out. They no longer fear the Chinese regime in many parts. And so when it comes to that, internally, they are very much destabilized. When it comes to external, poli external politics, countries are pulling their factories out of China. They're calling out China diplomatically. They're talking about decoupling with China. They're talking about securing their uh, sourcings for different productions. For example, Japan is actually paying companies to move their productions out of China. The Chinese regime isn't going to, I don't think financially, I don't think ideologically, and I don't think internally among the way people in their own country perceive them. I don't think it has a whole lot going for it. And I honestly, again, I don't think the Communist Party itself is going to survive this. You don't think they are? No, not at all. Tell me why you say that. Because, you know, you have Gordon Chang that you had on. He wrote a, company, he wrote a book called The Collapse of uh, uh, China. And he wrote that book a long time ago. And it never happened. It's been over two decades since he wrote that book. And it's still around. China's getting stronger. Pre-coronavirus, they were getting stronger. Why do you think that, that the empire is going to collapse? Well, it's because what is the foundation of the empire, right? What is the foundation of it? Outside of China, they maintained, they maintained their social controls basically through soft power, soft power, financial interest, and then, you know, some political subversion, getting politicians in their pockets. I mentioned before the, uh, sorry, the uh, uh, United Front Working Department, the one that I had done a lot of reporting on. You know, one of the ways that works is by inviting politicians, business leaders back to China, you know, getting them business deals, maybe getting them caught in honey traps where they might, you know, may sleep with a young girl and have video cameras record the whole thing. Uh, this is very, you know, very common practice for the Chinese regime. That so, when it comes to political influence, when it comes to soft power, a lot of that's being called out right now. When it comes to their control in universities, for example, just as a part of this, uh, there are multiple investigations being done right now into, uh, for example. Uh, different academics who have received gifts from China that they had not previously disclosed. There are a lot of public reports about this. The Department of Education is investigating it. Uh, for example, this Dr. Charles Lieber, the head of the chemistry department at Harvard, was actually caught in that. For example, he was taking something like 50K a month from the Chinese regime and was, being, uh, was working through its Thousand Talents program. Now, when it comes to the business side, it, a lot of companies are already pulling out of China. It's not financially feasible to stay in China. And, you know, really the benefit of being there isn't as much as it used to be. You can go to Cambodia, you can go to Mexico, you can go to, you know, v Vietnam and manufacture just as cheap without having to deal with all the crazy politics. And so companies are pulling out. And once they pull out, what, what incentive do they have to ever go back in? We also saw, for example, with the face masks in China, U.S. company, you know, 
running in China, making these global face masks. China demonstrated that they can nationalize a company like that, that they can take it over and forbid an American country from selling to America during a time of crisis. And so now in the U.S. you're talking about securing supply chains, making sure that that never happens again. And many countries are doing the same thing. When it comes to the Chinese regime trying to buy up, you know, different countries, buy them off through things like debt traps, uh, one belt, one road initiatives, things like this, building infrastructure in countries, getting them in, again, debt traps they can never pay off. And then through that, being able to take over natural resources, critical infrastructure, et cetera. That's also being called out. That's also being stopped. Uh, in fact, the coronavirus has basically derailed the entire One Belt, One Road initiative. And then you have also different countries, including the UK, including India, including many others, uh, working on things to forbid Chinese foreign direct investment because they're worried the Chinese regime is going to manipulate the current financial environment where country, where, you know, the stock markets are crashing to do hostile takeovers of companies. And so, you know, it's, it's almost like everybody sees them for what they are at this point. Everybody knows what they're doing at this point. The narratives no longer work. The mask, again, has fallen off. They're seeing the Chinese regime for what it is. And they're not playing the games anymore. You think that's going to cause them to collapse? Because I, 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 think, uh, 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 I think they have, I mean, think about it. You got, what, 1.5 billion people there, 1.6 billion, whatever that number is. How many people are controlled by the current philosophy of running the country. And what I mean by that is influential people, not voters, not populists, not just the average working class person that's in China. I'm talking about people that are part of the you know, CCP, the party that want this thing to continue. That's a pretty big, uh, you know, big party, big, big uh, uh, army that they have. You think they're gonna let this regime go down? For that to happen, it needs to I be a massive revolt. How does that happen, though? I think it's already happening. Actually. You think it's already happening internally? I think so, yeah. With the leadership yeah. team. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, Epoch Times, we get a lot, you know, we have, so it's interesting. Of course, we started in 2000, and of course, we've, from the very get-go, never folded to the Chinese regime's pressures. You know, we've, we've kind of established ourselves as, you know, the China experts. We, we've never folded to the Chinese regime. We, we've always been very critical of it. We've always exposed what it does. And one of the effects of that is that whenever anyone wants to defect, whenever, whenever anyone wants to get information out, whenever anyone wants to leak a document, they typically come to us. We get regularly, almost every day, leaked documents coming out of China. We get top level officials telling us what's really happening there. The real picture of China is that many people within the Communist Party, they no longer believe in the Communist Party. They no longer fear the Chinese Communist Party. People now, you know, even, even within, say, where things are at with this virus, I'll give you a few examples. You have local governments defying top level uh, political guide, guidelines. For example, when they tried opening up Wuhan and you had uh, Chinese people trying to go back to work crossing over in one of the nearby provinces, the local government stopped them. While the Chinese regime, top level powers, was trying to you know, open things up and create this image of harmony, local government apparently sent police forces. There was a riot on one of the bridges. Now this showed two things. One is local government defying top level politics. And the other side of it, you had a, sh a show. The Chinese people will riot. They will overturn police cars. They will curse the communist party. They will stand up against it. Because again, when you're a communist country that has maintained social control, basically through fear and through financial interest, both of these things are destabilized. And so what is the basis of power for the regime? And the basis of it maintaining its totalitarian system, again, this narrative that the party knows better than you do, right? The party can make better decisions than you can. And so of course the party can choose, you know, your basic decisions in life. Of course the party can dictate what you choose to believe. When people no longer believe in the competence of the party, again, that is destabilized. And so the Chinese regime is facing all of these things right now. You know, one of the things I'm curious about, I'm trying to search it to see if I can find this online, is what is the average age of population in China? Meaning, is it more younger, older, middle age? Where is that age demographic? Uh, I'm not sure, to be honest, but because of the one-child policy, they do have uh, they do have an issue with, you know, an aging population, and they do have an issue of the younger generation not being big enough to basically hold it up. And, of course, they got rid of the one China policy. There, there's some nuances to it. It's a bit complicated. But what they found is a lot of people are still not having kids, not as much as 
they anticipated. And so you I'll, still have a pretty big crisis with that. I only ask the question is because if, if a populace is going to revolt against a nation, it has to be a younger populace because the older populace gets too conservative and worried about the consequences because uh, the older generations worry about their kids and grandkids. And when you're younger in your 20s, you're not really worried about anybody. You're willing to revolt. So if they got a younger audience, they could. But if they got an older aging, uh, uh, you really need to have a lot of audacity to go up against a regime like that. I'm from Iran. And uh, I can tell you there is a lot of strength when the younger audience decides to go up against an older. This is how a Ron Paul and a Bernie Sanders were able to get very close to being a nominee because they were able to get the younger audience uh, organized and motivated to, uh, 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 to get them going. So, yeah, th 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 that would be one part. If they can do that, maybe there's a potential. If not, I just see them bullying too many people. I mean, the things you were explaining about saying having uh, uh, powerful people come in and have sex with a younger girl and then record it and use that as a threat form or paying $50,000 to professors or people that are working right now to positively make them look good. How much of that do you think is slowing down in America, meaning China having people internally working on medias or buying media or teachers or professors or influential people, how much of that is still happening today? It's a huge, massive scale, not just in the U.S., but in just about every country. So, for example, in Canada, they had the Sidewinder report from their equivalent to the CIA, which detailed how the Chinese regime had basically bought off a lot of politicians. In Australia, this is actually a discussion in the mainstream you know, news outlets. It's, it's part of the cultural discussion right now, the degree to which the Chinese regime has bought control of their local politicians, the degree to which the Chinese regime is able to influence the society through things like this, not just at the political level, but even at the universities and things like that. In the U.S., I think the discussion is just starting. It's just now being, I think, the lid is being opened. And I think people are going to start seeing the extent to which the Chinese regime has gained control over a lot of our politicians, has gained control over a lot of the decision making in this country, not just on the financial level, but even on some of the direct uh, levels. When it comes to things like the Confucius Institutes, Chinese funded, you know, language and culture programs at universities where universities are taking money from the Chinese regime uh, when these institutes can implement all kinds of things like censorship and such. Uh, they're being called out in a lot of countries. Sweden, for example, just banned the last Confucius Institute from their country. When it comes to things like the Torch program, the Thousand Talents program, the 973 program, the 211 program, essentially a basket of programs the Chinese regime has, official open programs to subvert our academic institutions and our business institutions. They, they op they're open about these things. And so the Chinese regime is very aggressive with this. It, not only is it aggressive with it, it doesn't even try to hide it in the U.S. because for so long it has acted with audacity. It is not afraid. It, you know, it, it, it wasn't afraid of people looking into it and trying to figure these things out. Uh, this is an example. Last I checked, even with a few weeks ago, the Chinese consulate website in New York has the United Front listed as one of its operations. It has the uh, liaison department listed as one of its operations. The liaison department is under the general political department. This is the political warfare branch of the Chinese military. We all heard all this stuff about, you know, Russian disinformation and Russian interference in our elections. China has an entire military department dedicated to this. The general political department run through the, run through the liaison department operating openly in New York City through the Chinese consulate website. Uh, there's a think tank uh, Project 2049 Institute, Institute had a whole report actually on the liaison department. So uh, uh, how, how many similarities do you see for you to make a, uh, uh, you know, a statement to say you believe they're going to go down and they're not going to stay like this? How, how much similarity do you see between them and Russia pre-communism and post-communism when Russia was going strong with communism and then all of a sudden, hey, you know, bring the wall down and the next thing you know the philosophy changes this is post Gorbachev and things start kind of opening up a little bit more how much how much similarity do you see between Russia and China the old Russia with the current China the situation is actually very similar on, on many fronts and so you know whereas the Chinese regime has these systems of overt warfare uh, under under the uh, Soviets they called that ideological subversion this unrestricted warfare program, the Soviets would call it ideological subversion. It's the same thing. China, the Chinese regime has carried the torch of it. 
when it comes to business ties, it's very much the same thing. Uh, you had a lot of big corporations manufacturing in Russia. You had a lot of the same you know, overlapping business interests, although on the political level, there was a lot of conflict. When it came to the academic subversion, you know, the, the, commun the communists in the Soviet Union were pushing for the global communist revolution. And a lot of academics and a lot of people in Hollywood were you know, working with the Soviet regime. And of course, at that time, if you were you know, a Communist Party member, for example, it meant you were loyal to the Soviet, the Soviet regime. The system is, is, is exactly the same. The only difference is that at the time, a lot of people recognized the Soviet Union as a hostile nation to the United States because you had threats of nuclear war. It was a lot more military, you know, the perception was a lot more military based. The Chinese regime doesn't have that perception. And so they're able to operate with a lot more impunity. They're able to operate with a lot, you know, a, a cleaner face, essentially, for the world to look at. Uh, but essentially, the situation underneath the hood is all the same. It's exactly the same. And just like the collapse of the Soviet Union, I, I frankly believe that the collapse of the Chinese Communist Party is going to catch a lot of people by surprise. Timeline. What's your timeline? Timeline? Uh, okay, here's, here's why I see things playing out. United States is going to launch an investigation into the origins of this virus and into whether the Chinese regime mishandled uh, information, for example, through censoring it, which allowed it to spread internationally, uh, left many countries unprepared for it. Many countries are calling them out. Even Iran, notably, is calling out the Chinese regime for this, for lying to them, for misleading them about how dangerous this virus was, about telling them that it was no big deal. And of course, a lot of the leadership have, got, have caught the virus and a lot of the leadership is dying from it. Um, in fact, there have been some reports noting how strange it is that it seems to be especially targeting the leadership of Iran. Iran is one of the Chinese regime's closest allies. You have the same thing with Russia. They're kicking out Chinese nationals. They're expatriating them. Uh, they brought, you know, Russia as well bought a lot of Chinese PPE, this protective gear for the you know, medical, uh, front, you know, medical frontline workers that's being found to be non-functional. A lot of countries are angry at the Chinese regime right now. Many countries, the United States very likely frontlining it, front it, are going to launch investigations into this. We know that at the very least, regardless of how the virus got out, intentional or not, lab, or lab origin or not, the Chinese regime lied to the world. The Chinese regime censored information. It uh, disappeared or arrested individuals who tried warning the world about it. And very likely, you're going to have the Chinese regime get called out on this. It's going to be called out with these investigations. And then right on the heels of that, you're going to have international lawsuits. And of course, there's a question of whether or not you can hold a country liable when it comes to these lawsuits. But what we're going to see very likely are sanctions. You're going to see all the manufacturing getting pulled out of China, of not just the U.S., but many different countries, supply chains pulling out of China from many different countries. And you're going to see what is very likely going to be an economic collapse inside China. And you're going to see a lot of people out of work, very unhappy with the Chinese regime, whose belief in the regime has already faded, who already no longer believe the regime's narratives, who already see through its lies and its propaganda. The Chinese people, they're not stupid. You know, they know, they know they're getting lied to. As if you read what Chinese netizens say about it on a, on a daily basis, it's a joke for them. You know, they, they, they joke about it. Now, the, when it comes to where, where, where things are heading, Internationally, there's going to be a decoupling. The Chinese regime's you know, facade of this friendly veneer, it's all going to fall off. The Chinese people themselves are very likely going to stop supporting it. And we're going to see a few different possibilities. One is a full collapse of the Chinese regime, uh, where very much like the collapse of the Soviet Union, they tried to transition to a different system. That is, of course, dangerous. What we saw with the Soviets was you know, it collapses, they move to a free market economy, but who has all the money? It's all the former Communist Party leaders. And of course, they just buy up the natural resources and the businesses and create an oligarchy basically run by the same individuals. Um, I, hopefully, China will have learned its lesson from that and they will not repeat the same mistake. Maybe they'll find a better, better way of going forward. Other possibilities, you'll see a balkanization where local governments basically stop listening to higher, the higher levels of the Chinese Communist Party we're already seeing signs of that where there's, you know, they're not cooperating. They're not listening to higher authorities. When the Chinese, you know, top level government says implement this policy, they're not listening to it. We've, we've seen a lot of cases like this. And so there is a, possib a possibility of balkanization. And uh, I, I think 
through these or a combination of these means, yeah, within maybe a year, I don't think we're going to have the Chinese Communist Party anymore. You're saying within a year? That's a bold statement. Yeah, and, and, and I, I really think that's where it's heading, based on these, based on these different trajectories. A year, you're saying, uh, 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 okay, so here's the other question. How, how united are we on this belief that you just shared in U.S.? Are Democrats and Republicans on the same page about China today? Um, it does seem so. It, it, China is one, of the, is one of the few bipartisan issues, not just when it comes to, say, the way it's handled this virus. You know, I, I think with this virus, it's a little complicated because it's being politicized to a, to a degree. Um, a lot of the left, you know, the Democrats, for example, they do want to say Trump mishandled this. And some of the articles you've seen from you know, big media, which do lean left, they've actually been used a lot by the Chinese regime and its propaganda because you know, they're trying to shift blame to the United States, saying the United States did not handle things well and so on. That's one of their big narratives. But really, at the top level, when it comes down to it, it does seem like this is a bipartisan issue. Um, you know, left and right, Democrats, Republicans, they do seem to be recognizing the Chinese Communist Party for what it is. In fact, there have been some public polls on this uh, asking, you know, people, you know, what do they think of the Chinese Communist Party? What do they think of China's handling of this? And for the most part, it seems people are on the same page, Republicans and Democrats, that they see through it. That would be the biggest thing. If we're on the same page, this can happen. But if the media is constantly pinning, saying, no, it's not China's fault, it's U.S.'s fault, no, it's not U.S. China's fault, if we're not united, I don't foresee that taking place. Because what helped us different countries go through a revolution was a backing from a, you know, a behemoth uh, country like the U.S. to say, yes, we support the re revolution. If U.S. doesn't do that, China is not going to go through that process. The, the, they will be bullied by the government, I believe so, over and over and over again. By the way, how much have you looked into uh, what happened recently when Yahoo put out the article with this recent doctor, uh, uh, the research on a virgin making very significant coronavirus findings shot to death? How much have you investigated that so far? Only a little bit, but I, I can I can give some additional insights into that if you, if you'd like. Please, just in terms of the periphery of issues like this. Now, of course, there was this doctor who was allegedly on the front lines of you know making some big breakthrough with this virus. I did have some people in, uh, email me saying they knew this individual. Uh, after that came out, I haven't I haven't verified it yet. Um, what I've been told is he was working on a vaccine and he was very close to completing that vaccine. That, that's what I've been told. Can't, I haven't fully verified it yet, so take it for what it's worth. Um, it's not clear who the individual was who killed him. It does appear to be someone who knew him. Now, a few different pieces of this. The, now, for me, this does bring to mind a few different investigations I've done. For example, um, there was a case, for example, several, geez, several years ago now, where there was a murder in Texas of an entire Chinese family. Uh, father, mother, children, all murdered in what appeared to be a very professional hit job. You know, uh, it, it, it looked like a professional hit job, basically. Uh, ex, you know, they were all executed. Um, there were reports in China that it came out that Zhu Yong Kong, the former security czar, called for that murder. That was never verified, but there were, there were reports in China saying that. And at the time, Zhu Yong Kong was facing trial through this whole anti-corruption campaign. He was being purged by the top level leadership. And so it is possible that hits like this can take place. Allegedly, the individual in Texas who was killed was involved in some big oil oil deal that was going on that Zhu Yong Kong was wrapped up in. I did look into that a little bit. He did, have, he did have a lot of overlap with certain high level Communist Party uh, figures, including ties to Jiang Zemin, the former head of the Chinese Communist Party, which would have been Zhu Yong Kong's political camp, because there are different factions in China. Uh, that was never fully verified, but again, there were reports in China about that. Um, a few other cases, just as an example, I've never actually talked about this publicly, but um, in New York, for example, when I was doing a lot of my investigations, one of my sources was a former Chinese spy uh, who actually helped the Chinese regime develop a lot of its overseas, say, overt espionage systems. For example, working with these fraternal organizations, which we call Tongs. Um, he told me about several murders that had taken place. And these murders were allegedly tied to, you know, spy versus spy things among uh, Chinese, basically 
Chinese military spies and Chinese government spies in fighting on foreign soil, namely in this case, US soil. And the two of the murders were pretty brutal. One of them was an individual. They tied him to a chair, cut his throat, and then set him on fire. Uh, with him, all the evidence was, of course, destroyed. The other individual was a Chinese woman who was killed. The individual who killed her was apparently a boyfriend, and he cut out one of her organs and had it on his person when he was arrested. Now, when I was trying to investigate this, some very strange things came up. Well, one is I, I, it ended basically because people I needed, I would have needed to interview were dead uh, or gone or would not talk to me. And because, uh, for example, in the fire, evidence was destroyed. But the people who did talk to me told me the same thing. They said that this was that, you know, for example, one of the individuals was a spy, a Chinese government spy. And the individual who killed that person was also a Chinese spy but it was infighting between military spies and government spies. Point being on with between these two cases, the, these people do things like that to each other. Uh, whether the, if the Juyong Kong case was true that, you know, killing an entire family in Texas, having them killed through a hit job, which was what was alleged in China in some of these reports, you know, that might've been the case. Uh, you do have suicides, sometimes very bizarre suicides when there are investigations underway into the Chinese regime. For example, when Huawei uh, was first being called out when you know this top level uh, Huawei executive was arrested in, in uh, Canada, for example, you know you do have things like there were people go and kill themselves and people do suspect that maybe the foul play was involved. Yeah, the difference with this is the guy that killed him went in the car and then killed himself. So I don't know if it was... Yeah. Uh, that much of a hit shot because what hitman kills themselves that's their business you know so yeah whether it was something more you know motivation i don't know what it was i'm curious to know what comes out of it uh uh with where this goes by the way final thoughts i'll, I'll give it to you is what, what what you know as you're going this is this is what you do some people wake up in the morning and they're stockbrokers all they do is study the market some people wake up in the morning they're doctors. All they do is read articles on what's going on with the field they're a part of. Some people wake up in the morning, they're in real estate. They read every article having to do with real estate. What is the latest you know about what's going on with China right now in regards with U.S. and China? Well, right now, there's a big propaganda battle. This is, this is the big area right now. Uh, the United States is, of course, calling for investigations into the Chinese regime, conducting investigations. There are international calls you know, Europe, different countries in the EU, UK, Australia, Canada, I mean, you name it, they're calling for investigations. And the Chinese regime is trying to challenge those investigations through threats, through diplomatic threats. They're trying to challenge those investigations through financial threats. They're trying to challenge those investigations, name, you know, especially through this new propaganda push where they're trying to shift blame and say the United States did not handle its response to the virus well. And they're trying to say the Chinese, the Chinese regime was being responsible, held off the virus for two months while the rest of the world could, could uh, prepare for it. And of course, that's very easily debunked. The Chinese regime was you know, lying to the world about the severity of it, was relying to the world about human to human transmission, covered up it, you know, covered up the fact that there was human to human transmission, even when they knew it was the case. And then in the meantime, before they alerted the world, went and had, you know, uh, actually through the United Front, a matter of fact, there were some reports in Canada saying the United Front was involved in this, had all their foreign uh, you know, networks go and buy up all the PPE, this protective gear, before they told the world about it. And so they were able to cor corner the entire global market on these uh, protective medical gear. Um, you know, this is where it's at, this narrative battle. And it, they've, they've already pretty much lost the narrative battle, it seems. It's gonna be very interesting what happens next. Obviously, everybody's following very closely. Uh, how can people find you, Joshua? Uh, they can find my show Crossroads with Joshua Phillip on YouTube. They can also go to theepochtimes.com, T-H-E-E-P-O-C-H-T-I-M-E-S.com. We're going to put his links below. By the way, if you search him as Joshua Phillip with two Ps, one L, two Ps, one L. Just keep that part of mind when you're searching him. Joshua, again, thank you so much for making the time to be guest on Value Tainment. Hey, my pleasure. Thank you. So what do you think about China at this point of the game? I mean, we've seen so many different things about China. Do you agree with him when he says within a year he thinks the Chinese regime is going to collapse? I thought that was one of the stronger uh, uh, points that he made. And uh, I'm curious to know if you agree with him that that could happen within a year. Comment below. And by the way, if you enjoyed this interview, I have two other interviews I want you to watch. One of them is with Gordon Chang, who is a lawyer 
that lived in China for 15, 20 years, and he did business there. And he's actually in the documentary with uh, 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 Epoch Times with Joshua Phillip. Click if you want to watch that. And then if you haven't seen my interview with Daniel DeMartino Booth that was picked up around the world, got around 20 million views in different languages, different platforms. If you've not seen what she said about China, click on this. And if you've not subscribed to the channel, please do so. Thanks for watching, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.